Well, good afternoon, it's Charlie ZL2 CTM. Just thought I'd do a, um, a video to provide a bit of an update on what I've been playing around with over the last couple of days. So, uh, what you would have called from the last video that I was going to play around with um, a coupler called the Tandem Coupler I decided to, to play around with, uh, which is what we see here. Um, it's got a, a metal aluminium box there. Um, I've elected to use BNC connectors for the inputs and outputs. Uh, just because it sort of suits the, the power levels I'm using here and the uh, and some of the cabling I've got. But anyway, so um, we'll look at the, the electrical uh, wiring up in a sec. It's based around is using RG58AU um, cable uh, and a couple of FT50-43s which we'll look at. So from an electrical point of view, uh, let me just bring this around. Uh, this is the configuration here. So if we were to, that's exactly identical there, so whatever I'm describing in here is, is what we see uh, in the box. Uh, two transformers, um, I, in the end I elected to use FD50-43s uh, uh, as opposed to say a 50-2 or a 50-3. Um, I thought for the broad bandedness that I was after um, and the inductance which we'll look at in a sec it needed, uh, that seemed to be an appropriate core and, and also the power levels. Um, this a coaxial cable here, um, you will see in here, it's been stripped at both ends, but one end only from a shield point of view is taken to earth. So the transmitter here goes in a conductor, that inner conductor comes out and goes to the antenna. Um, there is a transformer that sits right over the top of the jacket material. Um, that white uh, tape you see there is some insulation tape. Uh, there's two and a half turns on each. Uh, uh, each uh, side there just to, to bulk out the diameter just a little bit just to make the um, the transformers themselves uh, a slightly uh, snugger fit. Um, what I didn't write down there is it's uh, number 26. So number 26 gauge wire for the two transformers uh, and we'll look at the turns ratio in a sec but this is from a configuration point of view this is what it is. Uh, so that transformer there, one side goes to earth, the other side comes across here to the uh, reverse port, that provides the reverse voltage. And the second transformer, notionally called T2, um, one side goes to earth and the other side goes to the other side here. So you can see it's uh, very much a symmetrical circuit there, which is something which I was striving for. Um, you do see subtly different uh, arrangements for this under the banner of tandem coupler. But uh, this is the configuration that I decided to play around with, and it seems to be working reasonably well. So in terms of the transformers themselves, um, at some point in time you need to work out how many turns you want to use for the two transformers. Um, and it's a bit of a balancing act uh, with a number of factors. You want to have um, N, as you can follow down here, we'll look up the top here. You want to have N, uh, N I should say, the turns ratio for T2 reasonably high, so therefore its inductive reactance is quite high and doesn't present to the, 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 um, the, the RF from the transmitter through the antenna a, a low load. So you want to have roughly three times our termination impedance, so I'm using 50 ohms, so three times 50 is 150 ohms, so I want the inductive reactance of that coil there to be uh, no less than 150 ohms at the lowest frequency of operation. And for me, the lowest frequency of operation is going to be the 8 meter band, or 3.5 megahertz. So down here, that's what I've done. So if XL equals 2 pi FL, and L um, is the unknown, and we're trying to solve for an L given that's going to be at least 150 ohms at our 3.5 megahertz, it gives us an inductance of 6.8 microhenries. And as I said before, I've, I've elected to try and use, or to use, a, an FT50-43, which gives me a turns ratio of no less than N equals 4. Um, so I can't have a, a turns ratio less than that. Now another thing you're trying to balance here, so that's one aspect. Another balance is, as the number of turns reduce, the overall coil length, or the length of the windings on T1 decreases. Um, that reduces stray capacitance between the windings and therefore it improves your high frequency performance. Now notionally my radios here, you know, I've, I've never used uh, 21 megs, let alone 28 megs. Um, but, you know, 
all things being equal, let's try and minimize that to see how high this uh, coupler will actually use um, in actual in real operation. So in other words, I'm trying to minimize N at the same time. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind too, or another variable with N, is the power at the Ford port, this port over here, in my, in, in my configuration, it's proportional to approximately 1 over N squared. So as uh, your number of turns decreases, the power that um, you can get from that forward port will increase. In other words, you're actually improving your low power performance. And we'd notionally said that we wanted this to work roughly around 100 milliwatts. It would be nice. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so in other words, we want to try and minimize N as well. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. Do I go with N equals 4 or do I go for a higher value? Um, if you look online, many, many uh, of these tandem couplers use ratios of like 31 to 41 turns. Uh, and in the end, I decided to take some guidance from the ARRL antenna book, where it was talking about this particular coupler here, and, and made a note that for the QRP operators out there, of which you know I'm essentially one of those and slightly higher, uh, a good value is N equals 10. So that's exactly what I've elected to do. So if you count the, the number of turns in there, both these transforms are the same with N equals 10. So having now done that, uh, in terms of the layout, we mentioned it's in a metal box there, trying to minimize any stray capacitance and the other kind of external interference. Uh, that coaxial shield, uh, you earth at one end only. So if you look back in here again, you can see that for both the two coaxial cables there, the inner shield has been brought out, but it's only earthed at one end. So it's earthed at this end for this one, and because I'm trying to make this symmetrical, it's earthed at the other end, or I'm more the point, the, the bottom run there, uh, it's earthed at the other end. The shield at the opposite ends of both uh, is just cut off, so it's not actually brought out at all, but it's just sitting there. So it's providing some capacitive shielding, um, but it's not actually uh, connected to both ends. If you were to connect to both ends, um, this coupler would not work. Right, uh, what else to say? Um, I've got a, uh, a shield there in between, so that's uh, um, electrically connected to that bottom uh, bit of copper there, which is then electrically earthed to the main case itself. Um, and that's there just to try and present or prevent any interference between the two sides. Um, and then just a little plastic. I've, I've drawn a little hole through there, and then through that there's a, a, a piece of um, shield, or not shielding, more um, insulation I should say, from a reasonably heavy gauge wire, so there's an interference fit there, and then through the middle of that passes our, our winding, so it's positioned uh, pretty well in the centre of that hole drilled there. Um, so that's from a construction point of view uh, what I elected to do. So in terms of actual uh, voltages, so what I'll do is I'll just, we'll just wire it up and then we'll just have a quick, a quick squiz and then we'll look at the numbers. So I'll put that back down there, and hook it up. Let's take the sun off, sun off that uh, screen there. So uh, if we were to look at the O-scope, so at the current we're sitting on um, 7.1 megs, uh, and just a small amount of power just to um, just to see that it's actually we're working. That's all we got there. So that's our forward voltage that's coming off the forward port, and that's our reflected voltage. Um, and then if we were to vary the power there of the CW, you can see that. Um, so, like I say, that's that's exactly what I did. And then for the next, next lot of measurements, what I decided to do, or have done right or wrong, is um, set up uh, 5 watts in. So I've just decided to go with uh, 5 watts for a start and terminating with a 50 ohm load on the antenna port. So 3.7 megahertz with 5 watts going in. Uh, the voltage at the forward port is 4 volts, and the voltage at the reflected uh, port is 0.22 volts. And then I've done exactly the same thing up in frequency for the four bands that um, I've got available to me on, the, on this particular radio. So 7.1, 14.1, then 21.1. The forward voltage, as you can see, is pretty constant. So 4, 3.9, 3.85, 4.4, .4, so, you know, reasonably constant. Uh, but of interest is the reverse voltage. You can sort of see that slowly climbing 
as the frequency of operation increases. So I mentioned before that um, uh, the power at the Ford port, the available power at the Ford port is approximately or is uh, proportional to 1 over n squared. So what I did is I decided to elect to take um, this voltage here. So for 5 watts in, uh, what would be the power that 4 volts peak to peak could deliver into a 50 ohm load? Uh, which comes out as a ratio of 125, which is pretty close to, um, or square root of 125 is 11.2, which is pretty close to our 10 squared. So 10 squared will come to 100. So um, that relationship um, seems to be about right. I then decided to try and do a, a couple of other things. So I tuned to 7.1 megs and then reduced the output power down as low as I possibly could. Um, I did not elect to use or make up any kind of um, attenuators. I might look at that um, after this, but I basically just cranked down nice and easy the CW down to what was 640 milliwatts uh, going into the coupler which gave me a forward voltage of 1.64 volts, or in other words, 6.27, uh, say again, 6.72 milliwatts into a 50 ohm load, and the reverse port was 0.14 or 0.049 milliwatts. So in terms of dBm, um, which we'll use uh, in a sec, so uh, 10 log, those two powers there, referenced to one milliwatt, um, gives us uh, the equivalent dBm values. So for notionally, uh, notionally that is, um, half a watt, um, we can see there that on our Ford port we've got a roughly uh, 8.3 dBm and minus 13 dBm. In a similar fashion I decided to, uh, to crank up um, that particular radio up as far as it could go. Um, and that was the equivalent of 45 watts into that dummy load, which gave me a forward voltage of 11.2 and a reverse voltage of 0.69 which then comes out to be the equivalent of 314 milliwatts or 190 milliwatts into a 50 ohm load and then conversely uh, then reference to 1 milliwatt uh, 24, approximately 25 dBm and 0.76 dBm. Now I did those two values there, the, the minimum and the maximum. Notion that the minimum is, um, I acknowledge, higher than the 100 odd milliwatts but I wanted to see what that meant in regards to um, the limits of our 83, uh, the AD8307, which I'm going to use. Now, the spec sheet says that the AD8307 has a dynamic range of uh, minus 75 dBm to positive 17 dBm. Um, however, if you look at the the, uh, the graphs on the spec sheet, the maximum. Let me just come back as it's in focus. Sorry about the movement there. Uh, the maximum linear portion of the transfer graph is approximately minus that 70, let's go with say 65, up to that's 10, 15, so around that sort of plus 10 odd, uh, odd round. So that's the, uh, the most linear range. So if I was to use that in the calculations, then I want to make sure that I'm not going to uh, exceed the maximum power that can go into the AD8307 and I also want to make sure at the other end that I'm actually going to be able to detect um, that low uh, that low power end. So as I just mentioned from the graphs we just saw if we, if we take the the dynamic range of the 8307 to be minus 65 dBm to positive 10 dBm we can see for the low power range we had a figure of minus 13 dBm so that was, if I was just to quickly jump back to the other page, that was at roughly 500 or 640 milliwatts. That's the voltage we're seeing at the reverse port. So it comes out to be so 49 or uh, 0.049 milliwatts. One milliwatt reference comes out at minus 13 dBm. So in other words, um, that's good. So minus 13 dBm is significantly greater than minus 65 dBm. So I'm going to be able to detect it, and we've got a buffer there of 52 dB, which we'll see in a sec. At the high power end, uh, we've got 25 dBm, that's the value we had up here, so that was 7.1 megs cranked up as high as I could get it. Um, 
and we can see there that 25 dB is greater than the allowable 10 dB so that's bad bad um, and I'm over by a good 15 dB so on the face of it what I'd need to do then uh, if I want to use this for approximately 45 watts and why not um, then I need to have at least a 15 dB pad between the Ford port and the input of that particular 8307. Um, so I've got here a question mark 20, so why not build a bit of a buffer? So add another 5 dB, and maybe I should be looking at Amy to have a, um, a 20 dB pad um, capable of dissipating 25 milliwatts um, between the output or the, um, the forward port of the coupler and the input to the circuit board. Now I didn't mention earlier on, and from a construction point of view, um, I am not going to mount in that metal box uh, the uh, detection circuitry. I'm going to mount that in a separate box and then bring from the detector the, um, the low level DC voltages, uh, that'll be AC, and then rectify those and condition them uh, in a separate box. That's the current thinking anyway. And then just to also say that uh, that 20 dB additional attenuation, if I was to apply that to both the forward and the reverse ports, um, is a lot less than our allowable 52 dB that we had from here. So I'm not going to negatively impact our ability to detect that low power side. Um, so this is sort of still mulling in, the, in, the, in my mind, should I have a, a 20 dB pad on both the forward and the reflected side and part of me thinks why not um, as we can see here it's not going to impact either so that's essentially where we're at when it comes to uh, the actual um, coupler itself um, I don't have a vector network analyzer or anything else here in the shack to do any kind of directivity checks and um, any other kind of checks in terms of terminating at 50 ohms here and, and what does that mean for the other ports so it's very much a, a trial and error so what I'm going to do now is is wait uh, until those 8307s turn up um, and then start playing around with like I say an external circuit that will take the forward and the reflected voltages um, and then rectify those uh, feed them into or through the pad into the 8307 get that DC voltage out which will then feed into um, the next stage of the house or well, the next stage of the uh, the puzzle uh, which is a, uh, a software engineering issue um, while uh, while I'm waiting for those 8307s to turn up I did a little bit of um, playing around with the software um, and at this stage of the game, I'm sort of toying with the idea to keep things nice and simple and cheap is to use one of these 16x2 displays. Uh, this one has the I2C uh, backplane on it. Uh, another option, of course, may be to use um, a slightly more expensive uh, display here. This one is a 4x20. Um, not a huge much in terms of price. Um, you know, that's sort of $4 versus 10 um, you can obviously display a whole lot more on this, but in this particular configuration here, it's actually not too bad. So the bottom is, is obviously the forward and reflected power in a pseudo uh, needle arrangement. Um, so you can see here, that's our reflected power going um, increasing and decreasing. Now these are just test potentiometers here, just, uh, just for test the software out as opposed to anything uh, calibrated. And then as we can see here, our forward power there. So as the forward power increases, um, our power number increases. Now what I've elected to do for this power, um, like others, is the actual power that's been delivered to the antenna. In other words, our forward power uh, minus our reflected power should be the power that's been delivered to the load, in other words the antenna, and then our, um, our SWR reading there. Um, so that's why you can see that growing. And if we were to increase our our reverse, you can see the power number decreasing and the SWR increasing. So anyway, that's just sort of just shaking out the software and um, we'll totally refine how that looks in due course. But either way, what I guess what I'm trying to say is I think a 16 by 2 seems to be able to display uh, the kind of information you need. And the, and, uh, the, um, the, the, yeah, the, the reactive, or the speed in which that reaction seems to be quite good, so 
I don't see why I couldn't use that to tune, uh, say, an ATU uh, based purely off this display. But anyway, that's all I wanted to, to cover today. So um, I hope that was of, of use. Um, uh, you know, more than likely got a whole lot wrong, but um, it's all about experimenting and playing around and, and seeing what, can, what, uh, what it can produce. But, you know, bottom line up front, I guess, uh, this seems to be working quite well from from the, the low power, low frequency end all the way through to um, the high frequency end uh, for my shack anyway and, and the kind of frequencies I'll be using and the power levels that I'll be using. So at this stage um, I don't see any great need to play around with um, any other turns ratios at this stage uh, nor can I see a need at this stage to change the uh, the core material. So I'll just keep that at the moment as an FT50-43 uh, and see how it works out. Anyway, I'll say 73s um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, these logarithmic amplifiers will turn up and um, I can continue on with the project. Okay, cheers all.